list with my. I come in and they're in an Office Depot bag, and he's like, ah. Is Jay here? Oh, that's too bad. Uh, we, we, we didn't let him touch him too much. Hi, I'm Warren Finch. I'm director of the Bush Library Museum. Howdy. Howdy. It's great to have you here. So, I know we all remember these two great cartoons. Um, a lot of crime went on over these cartoons. The first one, of course, was uh, Barbara Bush uh, meeting Robin in heaven. And then that was, uh, uh, and then about, uh, what, six months later, seven months later, George Bush meeting um, Barbara Bush and Robin in heaven. So they were picked up by everybody. We had, these two cartoons are actually, copies of these cartoons are in our, in the exhibit. Uh, if you haven't seen the exhibit, it's open tonight, so please go out and see it and take a look at these two cartoons. We've actually, uh, just accession one of these cartoons to our collection. Thank you very much. So uh, tonight, Marshall Ramsey is going to talk to you about uh, the cartoons the, um, and, and a little bit about the, the other work that he does. He's editor at large at uh, Mississippi Today, a nonprofit news website. He's a two time Pulitzer finalist in 2002 and in 2006. And his work is internationally syndicated by Creator Syndicate. They have appeared, his work has appeared in the New York Times, USA Today, and the Jackson, Mississippi Clarion Ledger. He is author of several successful books. He'll actually be doing a book signing after the program uh, tonight, uh, including three cartoon collections, sh two short stories, Fried Chicken and Wine, he's from the South, and Chainsaws and Casseroles, again, he's from the South, and the delightful children's book, uh, Banjo's Dreams. Uh, Ramsey's cartoons, photos, stories, and posts are frequently shared on Facebook for you young people. Twitter, actually, Facebook is for us old people, right? Yeah. <laughs> Twitter, uh, Pinterest, and Instagram for you younger folks. He's also host of a, a weekly statewide radio program, uh, Now You're Talking with Marshall Ramsey, and a television program, Conservation Conversations on Mississippi Public Radio. He's appeared on Fox and Friends, Inside Edition, they were just here. Um, uh, CBSN, CNN uh, News Today. He's also a cancer survivor. Diagnosed with mel uh, malignant melanoma in 2001, he has uh, been honored by both the Melanoma Research Foundation, the American Cancer Society, for uh, paying his survival forward. He actively promotes skin cancer awareness, sun safety through cartoons, speeches, skin screenings, and 5K races. More power to him. I will not, however, screen you tonight. Thank you. <laughs> He's even run the Marine Corps Marathon to raise funds for melanoma research. He completed the race, raised $13,000, and developed some wicked leg cramps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his, uh, his, his wife Amy, their three sons, and their precious dog Pip live in Mississippi, the best state for politics, storytellers. Alabama's a good one, too and sweet tea, and raising a family, sure is. And his two sisters, Stephanie and Jennifer, are here in the audience with us, so welcome them all. Um, 30, 45 minutes? Yeah, we can leave that. Leave time for questions? Sure. Well, I do have a microphone on, if it's on. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, yes. okay. Thank you, by the way, for coming out tonight. You had a million other things you could watch on Netflix, and I appreciate you being here. Uh, the Crown is particularly lovely. I do recommend it. Uh, I, this is a huge honor on many different levels because my first president that I ever drew was George Bush. And so I never, well, I did Reagan for about six weeks. I was at the University of Tennessee, the other UT, um, like for the folks around here, I like to say if it wasn't for the for Tennessee, it would be the only University of Tennessee. But um, I really, really loved being a cartoonist, and I'll tell you a little bit of that journey. But uh, I got to meet President Bush when I was in college, and, and I thought that was incredible. So the fact that I'm standing here in his library now just is like I'm actually a little bit nervous, and I never get nervous. So this is kind of fun. This is what I do. I do television. That's me with Angie Thomas. She wrote a really um, a youth, a young adult book called The Hate You Give that she kind of did kind of well, uh, but she's awesome. That's my children's book. I do TED Talks. I do a lot of different talking. I love that. And, you know, Jimmy Buffett had a line in about pirates that said, occupational hazard means your occupation's just not around. 
Well, editorial cartooning is kind of like that now. There's, uh, when I started out, I remember when I graduated from college, I said, hi, I'm going to be an editorial cartoonist. And there were about 150 of them at that point. There's about 15 now. So there aren't full time that work for newspapers. So there aren't many of us left. And so uh, it is a wonderful profession, and I'm very, very proud to be part of it. This was my very first time I ever drew George Bush. That's 1988, that's him right there, kind of, it looks like his face looks kind of like a butt. Um, that is not, there was Gary Hart with his monkey businesses, uh, Pat Robertson, Al Haig with his medals. And needless to say, I've gotten a little better since then, but that was number one. This is my favorite caricature of him and of, of the other President Bush because of the caricatures on it. I thought they were perfect. Now, I could not draw President W. Bush, 43, very well until one day, you know, they don't look alike, but they kind of look alike. They have kind of the same eyes. And Jack Davis, the great Jack Davis from Mad Magazine, told me once that if you're going to draw a caricature of somebody, you've got to get the eyes right. Because when you look at somebody, you look them at the eyes. So I took the eyes from 41 and moved them over to 43 and nailed this caricature. And it was really a lot of fun. And I love this. And I love the Bill Clinton, too, because... When we lived out in San Diego, my wife and I would get invited to parties to talk Southern. They'd be like, hey, man, you, hey, dude, come on over. And I'm like, okay, dude. And they're like, dude, you sound like Bill Clinton, dude. I'm like, no, dude, I don't sound like Bill Clinton, dude. And they're like, dude, we have shrimp. And I'd be like, I'm sorry, I lied, Hillary. I didn't make it. And so they would give me shrimp. It was great. I gained a lot of weight. And so every time I see this cartoon, my mouth waters. All right, let's talk about a couple cartoons that obviously mean a lot to you, meant a lot to the family, and meant a lot to a lot of other people, and I'll tell you why in a second. When I found out that Barbara Bush was ill and that they'd taken treatment away and put her on hospice from COPD, my mother had died of COPD, or our mother had died of COPD, not long before she passed away. So when they announced that, I knew that, you know, it was soon. And I started thinking about her life, and I kind of started thinking about, here's a person who had everything. I mean, you think about it. She had a husband who's a president, a son who's a president, a son who's a governor. Neil's successful. Dora was incredibly, you know, wonderful. Her grandchildren are all successful. I mean, Jenna, look what she's doing on the Today Show. Incredible. She had a pl her own platform. She, people loved her. They had wealth. They traveled. They had everything. But she had suffered the worst loss that any parent could ever face. I just read John Meacham's wonderful biography on, on the Bushes, and I'd interviewed him for my radio show, and John was in, and, and so I guess maybe that's why I thought of Robin. And I thought, she's whole now. It's all good. They're together. Now, I haven't been to heaven lately. I'll, I'll be, and a lot of people are even debating whether I'll get there at all. Uh, but, you know, I just pictured this scene, and this is the sketch that I turned in to my editor. And I had another sketch, too, but it was really bad because I knew this was the cartoon. I just had a feeling that this was the one that needed. And this was what I did. And I, I am a little bit dyslexic when I design. So when I actually did the final cartoon, this is how it turned out. There was one little last-minute addition to this cartoon, though, that I think made the cartoon. The word mama. And if you look closely on the original when you see it here in a few minutes, you'll see where I cut it out and pasted it on there. Because I was thinking to myself, well, okay, how would she recognize her mom? Because her mom didn't have white hair and pearls in, in the 50s. And then I'm thinking, but is that how heaven works? I don't know. I skipped Sunday school for the last five years. I'm a little bit confused. But I knew she would know. So I threw the mama in there, and I think it made a lot better cartoon. So that's 8 o'clock in the morning, right? I finish it about 10 o'clock central time. I post it on the Clarion Ledger's website, and then I put it on Instagram. Within an hour, this happened. Jenna posted it on her Instagram. And as you can see at this point, it's got 120,000 likes. It had took off. Now, initially, Jenna wrote, someone sent this to me. I don't know the artist, but I love her. For two hours, I was a woman. <laughs> My wife was ecstatic. She said, you finally understand what I've been going through because you now have sensitivity. But Jenna switched it back. That was awesome. And then I get this. Jeb Bush Jr. posted it, break out the Kleenex. So 
really, by this point, I realized the family had seen it and the family loved it. And little did I know about the time that I'm sitting there, you know, pondering about her not being well and her demise, that that's what they were talking about. They were talking about Robin. So I literally had caught lightning in a bottle. So Jeb Bush Jr. had posted it. Then I get a call from the Today Show. I don't, how many of y'all get calls from the Today Show? <laughs> I don't either. So I was like, hello, hi, this is so-and-so from the Today Show. We would like to use your cartoon on all of our platforms, which is a nice way of saying, can we use your cartoon for free? Sure, that's fine. Because I knew Jenna had liked it at that point. I thought, that's great, go ahead, that's perfect. So they posted it. I didn't think anything else about it. The next morning, Jenna runs an incredible package about her mom, and I hope you got to see it. It was really touching, and it was lovely. And I don't know if those of you who have small children or had small children remember what it's like to get out of the house by 7 o'clock in the morning to get everybody to school. At our house, it's like we invaded the beach of Normandy every single day. There's gunfire, gnashing of teeth, screaming, getting out. My wife teaches elementary school, so we all have to be out. Well, that morning, we were running late. There was screaming and gnashing of teeth, and we look up on the TV, and they're running the package, and at the very end, they show the cartoon. And then it got weird, because suddenly you had Savannah and Hoda saying, that Marshall Ramsey is the most sweet and sensitive man ever. And my wife's watching this going, that is the biggest crock of I've ever heard. <laughs> and I'm like stunned. You know, my phone's going off now. I'm here from ex-girlfriends. I have restraining orders against. And I'm like, oh, this is, I can't believe this. This is crazy. And, and then, you know, Kathy Lee comes on with her wine. I like that Marshall Ramsey. He's great. And I'm like, it was so weird hearing your name, Connor. And so it's like time suddenly slowed down. Here's Savannah's. Here's faith and motherhood and love and one sweet and profound drawing. Anybody who knows me would never confuse me with faith and motherhood and love. So to have them all to get my sisters over there nodding. So it was, uh, incredi it was incredible. And I will tell you this about the folks like Savannah and Hoda. They are incredibly sweet and wonderful people. And for me, it's refreshing to see people on a national stage that actually are personable and nice people. And so they were great. Here was Jenna's tweet to me saying, the image is so comfort. It depicts what we know to be true. Uh, like I said, the fact that the family loved it still to this day means the world to me. And if you have any doubts about the Bushes, you're here, so obviously you probably like them a little bit. Let me tell you this about the family. I walk out to my mailbox in June, and there's this many handwritten thank you notes. They didn't have to do that. And that meant the world to me that that was the case. Uh, it continued to get weird. Southern Living, I mean, all these news <coughs> sources were running stories about it. Pearls of Steel was actually my second cartoon idea, which I thought was kind of funny. If you saw my house, I will never, ever, ever end up in Southern Living. So this was kind of a rare moment. I actually went home and cleaned my house on this, on the case. So we had Savannah and Willie Geist and Brett Baer. So you realize what I've done here. I had NBC News and Fox News agreeing on something. <laughs> Nobel Peace Prize right here. Thank you very much. It was great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was good. Then my university found me because I guess they thought I had money suddenly. They were excited about it. I was like, I've been hiding you from you people for 25 years and you now found me. When President Bush had been so strong greeting everybody in the reception line, and of course he got ill and he had a blood infection, and anybody knows anything about sepsis or other blood infections, you don't generally beat that. And I really honestly, after that, a couple weeks after that point, I thought, okay, I need to be thinking about what to do for him. And so I started thinking about the cartoon idea that I would do. I wanted to kind of have an appropriate bookend to the cartoon, but then of course he popped back. And um, you know, I didn't really think anything else about it. So when he did pass away, I got, I was asleep in the chair, uh, because that's how I roll, right? I'm really exciting. Friday night, I'm out. <laughs> My wife comes in and wakes me up, and she said, President Bush died. And I went, W? He's really young. I don't understand. She said, no, the dad, I said, no, he can't. He's not allowed to. I mean, he's, he's, he's too strong. And she said, you need to do something. I said, I know. And so I thought of this idea, and I, so I just went ahead and just drew it and didn't even call my editor or anything. <clears throat> And this was the cartoon I had. A couple things about it. Number one, the TVM Avenger. A friend of mine has a TVM Avenger. I've gotten to fly in it before. 
Uh, that is absolutely an incredible moving experience when you're flying about four feet off the ground in a truck. And that's what that is, is a big truck. And it's just an incredible aircraft. And to think that 18 and 19 year olds were taking off of pitching decks in the middle of, of the Pacific Ocean during storms and fighting and dropping bombs just absolutely was such a moving experience. Good flight. So I wanted to get the plane in there because the one thing he stood for, in my mind, was service. Mm -hmm. You know, he stood for service, and that to me was the image that I could use for service. Um, if you'll notice, he's walking, and it looks like he has his jacket. That's kind of a little tip of the hat to the statue in the in Bush Airport, because uh, I remember flying out and seeing him almost like Superman with the cape with the jacket on there. So I had that, but I had them being greeted, saying, we waited for you. So I did that and finished it at 1 o'clock in the morning Central Time. By two o'clock in the morning, Brett Bear's talking about it on Fox News. It was going viral. Because I think a lot of people were sitting there wondering, well, what's he going to do after the other cartoon? Mm -hmm. Three o'clock in the morning, I just finally go to sleep. My phone's just lighting up. My social media is lighting up because of everybody's doing it. I get my dog, Pip. Uh, I can tell you about Pip for another event at another time, but <laughs> Pip decides at 6 o'clock in the morning that I had slept way too long and she needed to go pee. So it's 6 o'clock in the morning. I've been sleep, asleep for three hours. My phone goes off, and it's a producer from Fox and & Friends. And they're like, Mr. Ramsey, hey, we love the cartoon, man. Can you do a Skype with us right now? And I'm like this with my hair, and I'm like, no, can I do a phone in? Right, okay, so I did a phone in, and they asked me questions. I have no, I don't even remember the interview because I was so tired. And they said, well, can you do a Skype tomorrow with us? I'm sure, Sunday, that's no problem. So I'm sitting there with a computer like this trying to get the only clean spot in my house in the background, <laughs> and I'm getting every book that looks like I'm smart behind me. <laughs> We did the interview. It worked out great. My phone rings again. It's a producer. I don't know how these guys are getting my phone number. But anyway, the producer from CNN calls. And they said, hey, Mr. Ramsey, we really want to talk to you. We'd love you to come on camera with us. There's a satellite uh, place down in Jackson. We will send a car for you at 4.30 in the morning to come pick you up. <laughs> okay. But I said, you don't really need to see a car because I live in Jackson, Mississippi. The only real danger is I might hit a deer, you know, on the way down there. And my wife saw they're going, they're sending a car. You I was like, okay, yeah, I'll take the car. So I'm sitting there waiting. It's 4.30 in the morning. Car pulls up. It's a limo SUV. This is like the end of Pretty Woman, right? <laughs> so the limo pulls up. The guy gets out. He's even got the hat on. It's great. Opens it up. There's snacks. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So I go and I sit down in the car. And I said, can you do me a huge favor? And he said, what you need, Mr. Ramsey? I said, can you lay on the horn so all my neighbors can see this? <laughs> Please. So I did do it. Yeah, there's me with John Berman on there, me looking. That's a lot lighter, because I've obviously I've discovered food since that picture. Um, and uh, like I said, once again, CNN and Fox agreeing on something. It was pretty amazing. I tell you all that stuff, and I know that's kind of the personal side of what happened, because it was really surreal being... Like, the, the Washington Post wrote a story about it. It was the number one story for three days on the Washington Post website. This cartoon touched a nerve on many different levels. And I think my personal theory is that America is hungry for the kind of civility that George Bush represented. About service, about somebody that did not believe in the word I. You know, and, and if you go through the museum and, of course, you, you hear the words that his mother told him, you understand where he came from on that. I think people are hungry about that. But the cartoon took on another level beyond even the, the joy and, and that it brought the family. I think where it really became magic was when this started happening. I started hearing from people who had lost children. And they shared with me how the cartoon meant so much to them that they had hoped that they would see their children again. But they didn't just say that. They actually would stop and share their stories with me about their child. And I listened to every single one of them. Over 600 people wrote, emailed, or talked to me on the phone about this. And, and I did remove one slide from a message I got the other day from a friend of mine named Matt. And I say he's a friend. I've never met him before. But Matt had a little girl who looked very, very much like Robin. Um, her name was Sally, and she passed away from cancer. And he and his wife are struggling deeply right now. It's been a year. 
And I got a note from them the other day saying that there was a day when they, neither one of them could get out of bed. They've got two of their kids. They're, they're, they're really struggling. And they have both of those cartoons up on their wall and that they mean something to them. <laughs> Here's the thing. We're all artists in this room. And you may be thinking, oh, I don't know about Funny Boy. I can't draw a picture or I can't draw a stick man. We're all artists because every day we wake up and we start with a blank canvas. And what we do with that canvas can make a difference in somebody's lives. I have done over 6,000 editorial cartoons, and I'm going to show you every single one of them tonight. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't want to show you 5,000 of them because I'd think they were terrible. But the thing was, I was fortunate enough to have two cartoons that made a difference. And that means the world to me, and those two cartoons did. Um, I really did think a lot of the Bush family now. I obviously, it, I, I've joked, uh, somebody said, I bet... Ms. Bush would really like that cartoon. I said, I bet she wouldn't like a lot of the cartoons I've done over the years. And, and I kind of smiled a little bit about that. But I've really, my respect level has jumped to another level. And I guess I'm allowed to do that as an editorial cartoonist. But at this point in my life, I don't care. Now, to flash forward a little bit, I'm down at Orange Beach, Alabama. I'm there to see Hootie and the Blowfish, of course. Uh, we took our son so that he could go, you know, lower the average age of the audience by 20 years. And we're there. And we're sleeping in a little bit. The Today Show comes on. It's Veterans Day. This is my cartoon from Veterans Day. Or actually D-Day. I take that back. It was D-Day. And I'm waiting for my friends to come back home and take me. So I, we're sitting there. The Today Show comes on. And Jenna and Willie Geist are like, that Marshall Ramsey's done it again. And Jenna's like, he's just a small town cartoonist, but I love him. And my wife rolls over and goes, oh, God, not again. <laughs> All right, so this is my first editorial cartoon, I think. That's me yep. about four, I think, four or five. Either that or it's me after a few too many drinks in college. I can't tell when it was from, but it does say 1972. That is an airplane. That's a sun. Those are mountains in the background. I've done a lot of research and decided on this. I was not a savant, just to tell you that. I mean, I was, but I love to draw, and my, our mom was an art teacher, and she recognized that. And people always say, did she train you? No, but I always managed to have crayons and pencils, and I had two parents that supported me a lot. When I was eight, I told my dad, a guy named Dave Ramsey, uh, dad was a neat guy, water skied at 78, so it kind of tells you how dad rolled. But dad, I walked up to him, I said, I'm going to be an editorial cartoonist when I grow up, which is the weirdest thing an eight-year-old could tell his dad. Mm -hmm. And dad looked at me and he said, eh, you're probably the best one ever, which was probably the nicest thing dad could have said, you know, and it was the right thing, because he's probably thinking, you're really a weird little kid. But he didn't. And so I did it at the University of Tennessee. These were some of my cartoons there. Um, really was a lot of fun. 1991 is when I graduated, obviously, the Gulf War. So uh, my early, early tenure as an editorial cartoonist were lining up with the Bush administration. This was my first, the, my badge for my first job out of college. Pope High School, Marietta, Georgia, I was a custodian one. See, I didn't want you thinking I went straight into this great career. I, I, uh, and I just let you know, custodian one was not the best kind of custodian. It was the worst. Okay? But it was a great job um, because one of my coworkers one day came up and said, you're a nice guy. I'd like to go out with my daughter. And I thought, your standards for your daughter are really low. <laughs> But she, she, her, see, her husband had been an Eastern pilot, and suddenly she had to go work as a custodian also so the family could have health insurance. And so she said, yeah, my daughter goes to the University of Georgia. She just broke up with her boyfriend. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to be a doctor here. I don't know quite what you're thinking. But anyway, I've been married to her daughter for 26 years. So. <laughs> the worst moments can turn to the best. All right, we're going to go through here and go through some of my favorites. This was the first cartoon that I drew at the Clarion Ledger in 1996. Me trying to learn how to draw the state of Mississippi. Um, I'm still trying to figure that out. This is uh, local Lance Armstrong from Austin, Texas. Y'all may have heard about him. Um, yeah, isn't it funny? Because and I'm a cancer survivor, and I met Lance, and I was really impressed when I met him, and I'm really impressed about his cancer um, survival, but that's about it. So the, but anyway, that was fun. We had Haley Barber, who was the chair of the Republican Party, was our governor for a long time. Haley had a great sense of humor, and also Haley didn't get upset about cartoons. Yeah, the fourth panel is really scary. Uh, in fact, his wife, Marsha Barber, loved that fourth frame right there, which I don't even want to know what goes on at their house. But Haley came up to me the first time I met him, and he said, 
would you just draw me with the thin pen? Because that's how Haley, Haley talks. And I was like, that's funny. For those of you who didn't understand that, he said, would you draw me with a thin pen? And uh, so, but Haley looked a lot like Fred Flintstone. And once I got that down, I was able to do his caricature. Bill Clinton, God, he was, he was, and it was back during a simpler era when we had, um, we talked about things like Hillary and so forth. So. <laughs> yeah. She took the F out. That's actually kind of funny in its own right, actually, if you think about it. Yes, she did. Um, this is one of my 9-11 cartoons uh, before the attack, after the attack. It seems like we were like that for about two, two weeks. And I've always tell this story, and yeah, my sister's in the audience, but I don't think they'll mind me saying this. You know, there are times when we probably annoy each other as brothers and sisters and so forth, but if they need me, then I would hop in the car and drive with an astronaut diaper on to help them. And that's the way we are in this country. I always love that whole astronaut diaper concept. I just thought that was great. Uh, this is, I was OK Boomer before OK Boomer. This is how to panic, panic a baby boomer, and this was what went on in 2008. Reports of bad acid, and there's reports of bad assets <laughs> as you're watching your retirement go away. To pick on Bill a little bit more, uh, writer's block, chapter one, ethics. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's very funny. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> um, uh, state of Mississippi, this was back when the federal government said if there's a terrorist attack, you need duct tape and plastic to make a fallout shelter. And my first thought was, Half our cars are falling on shelters in Mississippi. We use duct tape and plastic all the time. This is proof that I can come up with a cartoon. This next one is a proof that I can come up with a cartoon idea under any circumstance. I actually drew this right after cancer surgery. I was high as a kite on oxycodone, but by golly, I can think about a cartoon idea. So I would draw for an hour, sleep for six hours, draw for an hour, and, and I did that for two weeks, but I never missed a cartoon that way. Medgar Evers, the civil rights leader in Jackson, an incredibly brave man, came back from the war and did a lot of things that I would never have the courage to do. This was for the 50th anniversary of his assassination. I did this cartoon. He was, a, he was an interesting guy. He's got an absolutely lovely family. And this is another cartoon based on a bunch of words right here. This was from Veterans Day this year. And let me tell you this about, I never served. And I regret that, to be honest with you. Our dad served and dad served in the U.S. Army. My father-in-law was a pilot in Vietnam. If my dad and my father-in-law and every other person in uniform did not do what they have done, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. And so for me, uh, this was a thank you note on a much deeper level than just a superficial thank you for your service because I'm very, very sincere about that. My son, my middle son, who's 17, none of my kids are, I, I think they're very unimpressed that I do what I do because they're my kids and that's how that rolls. Uh, but he, he looked at this cartoon, he said, did you draw that flag? I'm like, yeah. Does it surprise you I can draw? <laughs> I got this one right here. Welcome to Mississippi, the fattest state in the nation. I got some really, really, really fun calls on this one. Fat Tuesday, Hypertition Wednesday, Diabetes Thursday, Heart Disease Friday, Heart Attack Saturday, and Funeral Sunday. This is actually blown up and hanging in the University of Mississippi Medical Center, just to let you know that. So I don't know if that's a good thing or it's a bad thing. I get a lot of interesting feedback as an editorial cartoonist. It's amazing. Uh, we live in a weird time right now where everybody's so incredibly polarized, like the captain's turn on the no joking sign. I try to explain that to my kids. Oh, yeah, they used to let you smoke on airplanes, but if you sat in the back only, and they're like, it didn't like one big tube. I'm like, yeah, but it was before we really thought much about these things. This cartoon um, happened on the day of the Mississippi flag vote. We still have the Confederate battle flag on our flag, and there was a vote, and I was for changing it, uh, not because I'm not a Southerner, but because of some of the ramifications on that. And I was getting death threats all day long on that. It was April 17, 2001. At 5.30 in the afternoon, my doctor called me and he said, Marshall, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have cancer. And I started laughing. And he's like, why are you laughing? I said, this is the nicest call I've had all day. Thank you. I appreciate that. You really lightened my day up. And I was in surgery the next day. So it was uh, pretty amazing. But that was the year I, I was a Pulitzer finalist. 
1964, the evolution of the robe in 2005, it's when they were actually able to bring some of the Klansmen that had uh, ordered the, the killings that went on like the, the three civil rights workers, Edgar Killen, got convicted. So that was good. This is uh, one President Bush came to visit Mississippi after Katrina. And of course, there's a lot of controversy on that. But we had not had electricity, so we had no gasoline. So there were gas lines everywhere. It was really bad. So I just had him welcome to Mississippi, Mr. President. And he was waiting in line for, for gas. I'm going to go through these real quick because I obviously of, of hurricane force winds, trees down everywhere, no electricity. In the first images we saw from the coast, it was obliterated, and we realized that the world would never be the same. And this was the first cartoon that I did. Um, it was amazing, and a lot of times, anybody who had a plan, and not to pick on the U.S. government, but anybody who had a plan, guess what happened? That plan got washed out to sea. And it was incredible. I've done a lot of Sunday school over the years, and that was the first time that I've actually saw it come to life like that. It was incredible how many different groups came in, were able to pick everybody up, and there was people from all across the country, and I'm grateful to them to this day because they came to help my folks. Just a few more tropical depression. When you find out that you think you're covered by your insurance and you're not, a lot of people experience that because they basically, their house would get flattened by the wind and then the water would come in and they wouldn't pay because they said it was water and there was nothing in that coverage. Michael Brown, uh, of course, <laughs> one disaster after another. So this was the Katrina. The slow aid came in on the, hurt, on the turtles. <laughs> President Bush, um, 43, came back down for the 10th anniversary first responder banquet, and they gave every first responder a copy of this. There's an oak tree on the, on the Gulf Coast that basically uh, the legend is that two people meet underneath its branches and they're friends for life. And I tell you what, if you met somebody that came down to help, you're friends with them for life. And that's what went on the Gulf Coast. So we printed this up and gave it to everybody which was really cool. This was a house that I helped clean. Six people died in this scene. Two people that lived where that truck is, that was a carport. I was helping a guy look for his wife's wedding ring. She'd taken it off and the water started coming in and they had to evacuate because they were the last house destroyed by the, by the storm surge. And we were on our hands and knees digging through the muck looking for that ring. And one person said, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. And I looked at her and I said, no, we're helping this man heal. And he was, because everything we found, like we'd find a ribbon from his, his daughter's swim team, and we'd find a fork, and we'd find something else, you know. And so I went back on that 10th anniversary when President Bush came back, and went down to the house and knocked on his door and rebuilt a fortress. It's not coming down. And he opened the door, and I introduced myself, and this is what the area looks like now. And I said, I just, one question, did you ever find your wife's ring? And he said, yeah, we found it about two weeks after you were here. And that's always been the best story. I've always loved that. This was um, having a national platform, because a lot of people were focused on New Orleans, rightfully, there was a lot of, of chaos going on there, but rural Mississippi really suffered. So this was kind of my way of saying, hey, uh, we're over here. And then Recovery Bridge, which I'm happy to say did get recovered. Prize Patrol, I'm actually happier to see the truck behind you, <laughs> the power truck. <laughs> I've had Senator Lott for many, many years to draw. He's been a lot of fun. My son's in the Lot Leadership Institute now, which is kind of interesting because Senator Lott met my son and he went, oh, you're related to, yes, don't hold that against my child. But Trent once asked me is what I could do about the way I drew his hair. And I said, actually nothing. So <laughs> Trent's pretty funny. I like him actually. Um, this was the, the image that I did, um, which, um, you know, the raising of the flag in Iwo Jima on Mount Suribachi, uh, Joseph Rosenthal's photograph, very iconic image from the 20th century, but it was very appropriate for that day. And I've talked to a couple of Marines that were on Iwo Jima, and they said they couldn't see the first flag, they saw the second flag, and they knew that they might have a chance of surviving, even though they went on to fight for another month. But they said that meant hope. And for us, when the power came back on, we could get gasoline and get food, and that's when we had hope. Uh, King of Spain came to Mississippi. My first thought was they ain't Ellis, and my second thought was there's my cartoon and I can go home. <laughs> this was my first cartoon in Newsweek, and um, Newsweek doesn't, I guess, is an online site now, but it used to be if you were in Newsweek for an editorial cartoonist, that was big stuff, and I was very proud about that. Um, this was the pull Rudolph pull. This was during all the two the layoffs. Yeah, being in the newspaper business, this was a little close to home. Said Liz. 
when there was the shootings in Paris, this ran in USA Today. It was a pray for Paris with the words. Um, I support merit pay for politicians. <laughs> and I didn't just do this because my wife's a teacher and I was going to end up on the couch if I didn't, but I, I, I'm very passionate about this. A few more cartoons. We got Son of a Bush. Uh, this is the Iraq War. Ace in a Hole. This was like when everything was going wrong. I have two cartoons that hang, are hanging in my house on the wall. One of them is signed by a former governor and a TV reporter that almost got in a fight. And the other one is this one. And I got a call one day, and this lady said, Hi, I'm Mr. Aaron's um, assistant, and he would like the cartoon. I said, can you cut me a deal? And I said, wait a minute, Mr. Aaron, you mean, yeah, she said Hank Aaron. And I said, oh, really? And I grew up in Atlanta, so I was like, I like me some Hank Aaron. So I said... I, I'll give you the original if you send me back a copy signed by Hank Aaron. And I got that puppy hanging on my wall. <laughs> so I scored on that. Uh, this was during 2008. Yeah, Jim has just dropped on Wall Street. Thad Cochran, who was a very sweet man, who was very powerful in the Senate. Um, but you know, if you knew him, you would laugh because he, he was not this, and that's always kind of funny. Here's Haley. Marsha and I want to thank you for inviting me to in New Hampshire. I think he was thinking about running for president, and I thought, God, nobody's going to be able to understand him, and then they'll get a translator, and he says, like, hi, guys. <laughs> this is five years later after 9-11. Uh, sad, but well, actually the way it is now, too. Okay, this is the hardest cartoon I ever had to draw. I'm kind of going over. I don't want to go too far over my time limit. This was not done two hours after. This was done literally two after after the attack. So it was about the time the second tower fell. I drew this cartoon. I was sitting here thinking, what, what the heck am I going to draw? And I, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of cartoonists that can draw better than me. You can go through the exhibit and see that. And there's a lot of them that can probably outthink me. But what I'm good at is that no matter what's going on, whether it's me having cancer or the world coming to an end around us, I can come up with an idea. And so I, they showed this image of the Statue of Liberty in front of the smoke, and I said no, and I drew that. And there's a Bill Malden cartoon in there of, of Lincoln after Kennedy got shot, and I think that's probably the influence that, they, that I got from that cartoon. But I drew that in 30 minutes. And it went and it was in the New York papers, and I got a lot of emails and everything. And I was proud of that. This is the cartoon I'm most proud of, and it was two days after 9 11 because of the way we came together as a country. And I think this is probably my all time favorite cartoon. This was also one of the others. Um, yeah, this was more the visceral reaction that, you know, let's go get them. And of course, some of the 9 11 cartoons since then, you know, never forget for those of us who remember it. But the thing is, I teach a class at Ole Miss, and my students were all either in high chairs or not born. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so when I talk about 9 11, it's like I'm talking about Herbert Hoover. You know, it's really weird. This was, uh, it faded, but it still burns, the scar. When President, Bo when President Trump ran, I didn't think that, like most everybody on the planet, I didn't think he was going to win. This was one of the first cartoons. His hair has since been modified considerably since then, but um, his first day in office, our national symbol will no longer be bold. Huge. I mean, sometimes I do draw about things that are not, that are not, you know, this is you won the Powerball and the Steve Harvey. That's <laughs> All right, we're in the home stretch here. This is our governor um, who now, because Trump wanted to create a U.S. Space Force, mm -hmm. because he's so in love with the president, he created a Mississippi Space Force, which I'm <laughs> trying to trying to figure out what that is exactly and what it's supposed to do, but I just had him as Buzz and Woody. I now draw on the, on the iPad, and you can see the difference a little bit in my style. This is what's your superpower. I can take a classroom of kids who I didn't know what they're dealing with at home and engage them, so I did this for teachers. And, mm -hmm. Um, there's another one. Uh, Miss Smith can't be here tonight. She's busy waiting tables. <laughs> and of course, Joe Biden's uh, storytelling forecast models. <laughs> they don't really quite know where they're going to go. Mississippi, we don't have many Democrats left, and the ones we have are in their own museum. <laughs> 
and uh, in the spirit of impeachment, um, Christmas Carol 2019, <laughs> the Senate's like, don't worry, I got you in the grave. <laughs> As you can see, he's, he's modified a little bit since then. And here's Away We Go on the impeachment. <laughs> Earl woke up early to see if Facebook and Twitter had solved all the world's problems. No. Here's um, Booker, Warren, you know, O'Rourke, and Trump's tweets. It's like, oh, that one get on the stage. <laughs> you know, Notre Dame, when it burned, and that was, that was tough to watch. It really was. And it's amazing how, much thing, how many things they were able to save from. But you think those giant, the, the forest, the giant timbers, they'll never be able to replicate that because that was all virgin timber. But the fact that it was during Holy Week was not lost on me. So it's like, you know, today's sermon's about resurrection. Mm -hmm. We, we um, like Texas. Now, when I lived here, we had 25 inches of rain in 24 hours in Conroe, and they decided not to lose Lake Conroe, so they decided to flood everything down to Kingwood, which they did again a couple years ago just because they had so much fun the first time. And uh, so I'm not, I'm, I kind of know about floods. I don't like them, but we had one in the Delta, so this is South Delta Gothic. As you can see, I can play around with the iPad a little bit. State of the Union. Are you sure they're in something on Netflix? <laughs> I'll tell you what, can I just take y'all on the road with me? <laughs> y'all are my new best friends. Will you take a check? That's my question. That's National Guard. That's all I need to be at home. I do a lot of things now, and I'm very, very blessed that I still get to do the editorial cartoons, and, and I do children's books, and I do all kinds of things. It all comes from the same pot, I guess, technically. But I love my profession, and, and you know, I was teaching editorial cartooning, and I had five students, five whole students. And, you know, my profession is generally one that's usually males that kind of look like me that wear glasses and blonde hair. And all my students were female, and they were fabulous. Uh, their cartoons were great. They were anywhere from a junior toward there was one five, fifth year senior. And their insight and their view on the world was wonderful. And for me, as their teacher, I kind of felt like a jaded Luke Skywalker, uh, like in The Last Jedi, which I'm not going to talk about because it ruined my childhood. But <laughs> that, to, to see that generation being able to create visual commentary. Do I think visual commentary, editorial cartoons are dead? No. Do I think that there's a lot of challenges for my profession? Yes, because trying to figure out how to monetize this stuff is insane. Because unfortunately memes now, everybody thinks, well, oh, so you spent six hours on a drawing and researching and everything else? Hey, let's just go ahead and spread it around for free. But the point is, I think that, well, I know we are a very visual society and people enjoy cartoons. I still see the response that I get from my work and I'm very, very blessed that I'm still in the hunt and get to do what I love to do. To, to know last year, though, the two cartoons that I did were able to make a difference and be able to be seen and, and sit there and watch them being shown during the funerals and have people talking about them. As an artist, it was, I felt it was an out-of-body experience almost. And I'm my worst critic, trust me. Um, I really just honestly sometimes just beat myself up on my work and everything like that. But that was such an incredible honor and for me today to be able to walk through that museum and see him hanging up in a museum that's as great as this museum um, I will be able to carry that until the day I quit breathing and be very proud of that fact and the fact that y'all came tonight and wanted to see this presentation means a lot to me too now is I guess the point where obviously um, we need to open up the floor for some questions if not we can go out and visit and I, I do have books I brought a few I had to pack them on the plane, and I could only bring 50 pounds worth. So, um, and it's a heavy book. So, but just to let you know that all proceeds go to Kroger, which is a grocery store in Jackson, Mississippi, because I have three boys. Locusts with the thyroid problem, and frankly, um, at this point, you know, it's really just a point where so I can get something to eat. I was so grateful they fed me tonight. It's the first meal I've had in a week. It's, it's really good to be back in Texas. Um, so, because everything's bigger in Texas, and it was a big meal, and I'm very, very grateful. For that. I know for the first two weeks I lived in Conroe, they took me to Vernon's Country Catfish which is down near the dam on 105. And for two weeks, I ate every meal was brown. 
And I thought, I'm not going to live long. <laughs> but I'm going to die with a smile on my face, so it'll be great. All right, great. Open up for questions. Uh, don't be shy. I, I will not draw you into Mars cartoon. <laughs> So did you say you draw now with your iPad? Yes. He asked, do, you, do I draw my iPad? Yes. I have an iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil, and I use Procreate. And it's a wonderful program. In fact, I've been doing a bunch of Santa Claus drawings that I may turn into a children's book. But I did two of them on the plane. So I now have the capability, because I travel a lot with my new job, so I can sit in a Starbucks or a coffee shop in, in Macomb, Mississippi, and draw my cartoon and post it online, and that's good. And wow. it's so funny, because when I first took the job at the Coyne Ledger, I asked for a computer, and they were like, why do you need a computer? And now I've got like nine of them sitting around, including my phone and my computer and everything else. But yeah, I do it on that, and it really, it really is, is fun to play around with. And I can paint with it, too. I mean, I can actually do painting with it. So it's, it's a really neat toy. Yes, ma'am. So do you like provide one cartoon a week? Is that? Is no, I do six. You do, you do a cartoon every day? Yeah, pretty much. I've been a little slack the last couple of weeks, but and I'm not doing it while I'm down here because I'm going to enjoy being down here. Uh, but no, I, 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 was, I used to do seven a week. The Clarion Ledger, which was owned by Gannett, cut me to part-time in 2010. So they cut me to six a week because that's their <laughs> definition of part-time. <laughs> Go figure. Um, but that was the best thing that ever happened to me because that forced me to go do the radio and the TV and the other things. But no, I still do a lot, and I'm I'm very prolific, and and and, and I really believe that creativity is like exercise. The more you do, the easier it is. The hardest thing in the world for me is to not draw something for three days and then go back and try to think of it. So that's tough. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do I do a lot. So. Yes, sir. Are you left-handed? I am ambidextrous. Uh, I do primarily draw with my right hand. When I was playing football in high school, I had an AC separation uh, because I was a defensive end, and the other defensive end, who had an IQ of the same as his jersey number, decided <laughs> to run into my shoulder and mess it up. So I was like this for six weeks, and so I had to learn how to do everything with this hand. So I can actually draw as well with this hand as I can wow. with this hand. Wow. So, yeah. Which is a weird talent and will get me nowhere in life. Does your newspaper, when you submit a cartoon, do they ever come back and say, no, we're not running this? No, because, and, and, you know, there was a level of trust that I built at the Clarion Ledger. I had the same editor for 15 years, and the reason I'm a two-time Pulitzer finalist, which is a nice way of saying I didn't win, um, <laughs> I, I got to tell a story on Dad, and you'll, you'll know it's true as soon as I tell it. So, Dad took me to my first UT football game when I was in eighth grade, and Herschel Walker ran over Bill Bates, Georgia won, beat Tennessee. <coughs> stop, okay, just stop. She went to Georgia, she's obnoxious, okay? My wife went there too, I live with this. So, I decided I want to go there. So I would take Dad to Tennessee games, you know, just pay him back as we got older. And I'd just been named the Pulitzer Finals the second time, and I was all cocky and everything, and I was sitting there in Nalen Stadium, 102,000 people. And I said, I bet I'm the only two-time Pulitzer finalist in this whole stadium. And my dad said, and I'm the only other person who cares. <laughs> <laughs> does that not sound like our father? Yes, it does. So. Did that D. Dave Ramsey on the, the money? V. Dave Ramsey is named for my father. Our dads are brothers. Oh. Oh. So people say, is Dave Ramsey your dad? I say, yes, he's my dad, my cousin, and my son. And they're like, oh, that's right, your family is from East Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do kind of lack originality uh, on the naming things. So. Um, Dave actually calls my son George because it's just too, too damn confusing to have many Dave Ramsey. But yes, it does. Dad's greatest joy was he had a gold American Express card that said Dave Ramsey on it. Did you have all your cards? Oh, hell no. <laughs> now, it's funny because, I mean, yeah, Dave's stuff does, it helps people, and, and I love him to death. And Yeah, Dave and my sister Stephanie are contemporaries. I'm eight years younger than Dave. I'm the same age as Stephanie, of course. Uh, you know, but, but Stephanie looks a lot younger than Dave. Dave. <laughs> no, 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 I don't mean, no, I don't mean that rude, but I just, you know, Dave just looks, I mean, Stephanie looks incredibly young. I still have hair. <laughs> yeah, Stephanie still has her hair. So, no, Dave's good people. I love them. But yes, we are related, and it's weird. Uh, it really is. I'm very proud of him. He helps people, and, and so it's cool. One more. Who owns your cartoons? When That's you a good them, question. Who owns my cartoons? Once you put them in the Clarion Ledger, do you 
I own the originals. Um, okay. There's probably some reprint issues with the Clarion Ledger um, having them, and then the syndicate would have second reprint rights and everything else. Uh, now that I'm with Mississippi today, I have more ownership with my work. That was something I negotiated in with my package. Since they're a nonprofit, we are going to do a syndication service based locally, uh, and then the money goes straight to them because they're a nonprofit, and that's a way for me to kind of cut back on my salary a little bit for them. Uh, it's nonprofit world's fascinating. Uh, you know, we're kind of a model of the Texas Tribune. And so they hired me to kind of be Evan Smith, except I look like Evan Smith, but Evan Smith's Evan Smith, and I'm me. So, but it, it really is kind of the same type, type situation there. So it's really a lot of fun. But yeah, ownership rights, and that's one of the things I think a lot of cartoonists make a real big mistake with, is not knowing what's, you know, their rights and so forth. Um, but I'm, that was one thing I negotiated when I started with the Clarion Ledger, is that I was going to own the originals. So, because I didn't want one day them come lay me off and then just take the cartoons and dump them in the dumpster. Mm -hmm. And this, that has happened. Wow. God, I totally wore you out. This is great. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's it, like I said, just in wrapping up, I've, the last year, and like I said, I never would have dreamed I'd be sitting here talking to you. I've always been a really local cartoonist, even though I'm nationally syndicated. I don't think people pay attention to names on editorial cartoons that much. So to be able to get the ability to come speak and talk to you all tonight, it's just a dream come true. And um, thank you. I'm actually nervous, and I do this all the time, but I'm just like, this is really a lot of fun. So I just want to say thank you so much. Um, so, Excellent. come join us in the rotunda. We'll have a little wine and some hors d'oeuvres, and uh, we'll be signing, Marshall will be signing books. So, you know, feed him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah feed my children. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Again. Where, where do you all live? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm prompt to go.